Welcome to the Steady Hand Global Equity Fund update. Today we're talking to Elon Bitch Shlomo, who's a principal at Aristotle Capital, our sub advisors on the Steady Hand Global Equity Fund. He's going to take us through how his team go about investing in companies around the world and highlight some holdings along the way. Elon, welcome. Thank you, Salman, and thanks to everyone at Steady Hand for your interest in, in what we do. Uh, usually, when we do these interviews, we ask our managers to take us through their investment philosophy, but we'll do something a little bit different today. Elon, I'd like to start with a concept that, that stuck with Tom and me when we first visited your office in LA, I think, I think it might have been 2017. It's this concept uh, you refer to as the, you know, the private equity approach, uh, this concept of looking at a company as if though you're buying all of it, not just owning the stock. What does that mean for your process? And it would probably help if you took us through an example. Sure, absolutely. So we come to work every day with the mindset of a business owner, what we call an owner's mentality. Uh, and we're trying to understand good, we're trying to identify good businesses at attractive valuations with compelling catalysts, what we call QVC, so quality valuation catalysts. I'd like to you know, highlight two, two pieces of that approach that I think uh, really bring home this, this private equity uh, to public markets concept. The first is owner's mentality and the second is idea generation. So owner's mentality, you're absolutely right. When we assess a business, we're trying to understand if we should own the whole thing, not just one share. It's the same way when we value it. It's not just one share, it's the entire enterprise inclusive of, of all assets, liabilities, debt and equity. Thinking like a business owner means we also need to be long-term, which we define as three to five years. So that's the first. The second is idea generation. Instead of running quantitative screens, hoping that statistics will lead us to the next best idea, we spend the vast majority of our time learning and relearning our existing holdings. The output of that is sometimes we find new ideas. This is very similar to a local business owner. When you come to work every day, you're focused on your operations, your employees, and how that business can perform, not looking for new ideas, new businesses to purchase. So again, it reinforces that owner's mentality. An example, Sony. Sony is a Japanese conglomerate. Today, uh, we've been invested in the business since about 2018. Today, we'll focus on the music business for brevity. Um, they're the number one music publisher. They have the largest library in the world, and they're one of the top uh, music labels, so signing and promoting artists. We came to understand Sony and its transformation through our previous ownership of a European media conglomerate that competed with Sony and music. What we saw was a transformation. The then CFO, now CEO, Yoshida Sun, was improving the business quality, exiting low-end consumer electronics, things like the Vio laptop that some of us might have, might have had, exiting the battery business, businesses that weren't earning their return and didn't deserve investment. This increased the, the emphasis on return on equity, returns for shareholders and free cash flow, things we like to see. That transformation, that improvement in business quality would, was not captured by statistics. We needed to have the, for, the understanding of the business to see where it was going. Valuation was always attractive and the catalysts uh, in the music business specifically were fueled by the shift to streaming and the underappreciated economic impact that streaming plays have on a company like Sony with the world's largest library. So as more players like Spotify, Amazon, Apple Music come in and seek to play Sony's library, that means significant improved economics for the music business. And when the catalyst, the valuation and quality lined up, we were able to see the transformation and invest in Sony informed by our prior holding. You, you talked about value chain there, Elon. Supply chain, you know, related is, is super topical these days. Tell us how that factors into some of the some of the research that that you do. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're focused on, you know, again, understanding the business, not looking for the next best stock. Uh, a, a good example of this approach in terms of understanding the supply chain and value chain has been our research on the auto industry. Um, I think all of us as consumers recognize that there's a shift going on from internal combustion engines towards electric vehicles. How quickly that shift happens is a valid question. We don't pretend to know whether it goes from two to five to 10% over the next three to five years, but we do know, or we do feel comfortable that the shift to electric vehicles 
is, uh, is something that will take hold for the next several years and perhaps decade or more. Our research through on the value chain has resulted in us intentionally avoiding the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers. Think Volkswagen, Toyota, GM, or Ford. Why? These businesses require significant capital investments, significant expense increases to effectively operate two powertrains, electric and internal combustion at the same time. That means that their earnings are depressed, their cash flows are depressed for at least the next three to five years while they invest for the, new, for the, for the next wave of cars. We also don't know if Tesla is going to be the winner, GM will be the winner, or Toyota will be the winner. So that disruption occurring in the OEM space meant that we avoided those companies. However, we didn't stop there. We kept looking at the supply chain, and what we were able to identify is a unique supplier to these companies in Fanuc. Happens to also be a Japanese company. Uh, about 30% of their sales go to the auto industry. They, may, they are the largest robotics manufacturer in the world. Uh, if you've ever been to a plant, you'll see there the yellow big robotics arms. Um, these, uh, these goods, these services that they offer are critical to production. And so whether it's an electric vehicle or internal combustion vehicle, the increased manufacturing investments by the OEMs is a good thing for Fanuc. They have a leadership position, they have strong market share, they have a proven predictable product, and they're uniquely positioned to benefit from the increased investments by the OEMs. They're also uniquely positioned to benefit as wages increase. If employing people is more expensive, you'll need to get more efficient. Fanuc is there to deliver. So we believe this is a high quality company with an attractive valuation, which I think we'll talk about, and has significant catalysts. The last piece I'll mention here to put a bow on things is you can think of you know, the electric vehicle craze as um, akin to being a gold rush in California in the, in the 1800s. Rather than trying to find the next gold mine, Fanuc is selling Levi's to the miners. It's a pretty good position in the value chain in our view. Fanuc sounds like a super interesting company, but, but yeah, let's, let's talk about valuation because you've got to reconcile that for me. You, you've talked about how it's an, an important input into, into how you do your decision making. But if someone were to look up the stock on something like Yahoo Finance, it doesn't look really cheap. You know, if you compare it, if you compare its current earnings to how much investors have to pay today, it's actually, it actually might look expensive to, to a lot of observers. So, so yeah, just maybe reconcile that for us. Absolutely. And you're correct. If one were to pull up Fanuc on Yahoo Finance, I think it would look like it's trading at roughly 30 times earnings. That doesn't sound like a bargain. That doesn't sound attractively valued. That's why it's so important to normalize the earnings power of a business. When we approach our valuation, it's like an owner. It's not last year's earnings, this year's earnings, or next year's earnings, but it's given what we know today, given the assets that are in place, given the order book that's in place, what is the normalized earnings power for Fanuc? So what kind of sales can they do? What's the appropriate margin that this business deserves to earn? And what's the appropriate cash flow that it should produce for owners of a business uh, in a normal year? When we unpack Fanuc, what we see is that they've been investing also quite largely to expand capacity in places like China, where there are more electric vehicle manufacturers popping up every year. They've, been, they've done an interesting thing with R&D where they've elected to expense all of that up front. Many of their competitors uh, amortize that over a number of years, which serves to change the normalized earnings number. We dig through that and understand that in a normal, on a normalized cash earnings power basis, we view Fanuc as trading closer to less than 20 times earnings versus the 30 times headline number on Yahoo Finance. What does that mean? There's a roughly 30% upside to intrinsic value on our normalized earnings power for Fanuc. And effectively, it's a $0.70 cent dollar hiding in plain sight, which is attractive to us. So let, let's stick to valuation. Um, we got to talk about technology, which is you know, the largest exposure in the portfolio if we were to look at a sector uh, basis. It's not really an area that a lot of managers of your ilk have invested in, given you know, that emphasis on valuation. So, so where have you chosen to invest in the area and, and how have you gotten comfortable with some of the prices that you see? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, technology is more than just 
chasing growth or investing in the new, new thing. It's more than just owning the FANG companies or Chinese internet companies. In fact, other than Apple, we've had no investments in those businesses. So what is it about technology that, um, that deserves a 20-ish percent weighting in our portfolio today? Well, we're a bottom-up quality value-oriented manager. That means we must assess each business model and understand within tech, what does the company do? Is it a software business? Is it a hardware business? Is it a combination of the two? And that's how we approach it. Today, we have rough, we have eight companies in the technology sector. Some are hardware, some are software, some do both. What they all have in common is they are proven business models with high and increasing market shares, high and increasing operating margins, and tremendous free cash flow power. Some of them are in effect quasi-monopolies like Adobe or Microsoft. These are businesses that have proven themselves over time rather than the hope of being the next great disruptor. And that quality and predictability and stability of cash earnings is something we've long been attracted to. Today, the businesses are a little bit different than the ones in years past. We previously invested in Oracle and shifted that investment into Microsoft in 2014, something that has served our clients well. And we believe these businesses are uniquely positioned to continue to succeed. We'll leave it there for today, Elon. Thanks for doing this. Uh, it's been really helpful, I'm sure, to, to anyone invested in the fund. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to partner with Steady Hand, and, and we look forward to, to a long and beneficial relationship together. And thank you all for watching. If you'd like to learn more about Steady Hand and the Steady Hand Global Equity Fund, please visit our web website and, and hit the Get in Touch button. We'd love to hear from you. Until then, take care.